And uh, work has started to write next year's federal budget. The Appropriations Subcommittee of the House Financial Services meeting now to hear from two Supreme Court justices who've just entered the room about the budget needs for the court, Samuel Alito and Elena Kagan at the witness table. I know it's not every day that I can compare myself to two Supreme Court justices, but today both justices and I have something in common. This is the first Supreme Court hearing as chairman of this subcommittee. And I know for both of you, this is the first time you are testifying before this subcommittee. So I want to welcome you both. Additionally, this is the first Supreme Court public hearing since 2015. And as chairman of this subcommittee, it is my intent to hold a hearing with the Supreme Court uh, more often to discuss the resources needed for the highest court and hear your thoughts regarding America's court system. I think hearings such as this one are a great way for the public to get more exposure to our third branch. Today's hearing provides us with an opportunity to exchange ideas, discuss pertinent issues, and get a better insight into the judicial branch. The exchanges between our two branches are important as each branch plays a distinct role in our government. While we must collaborate with one another, we must also preserve appropriate autonomy in judiciary governance, management, and decision making. Our two branches walk a delicate line and what we must work together, but remain separate in order for our democracy to uphold the intentions of our founding fathers. I would like to thank the justices for their recent budget request. I'm always impressed with the court's dedication to cost containment and a desire to save taxpayer dollars, which has been demonstrated through the Supreme Court's consolidation of payroll, financial, and HR services. <laughs> We're deducting that. <laughs> and I'm resisting the urge to say that's why we don't have nice things. <laughs> uh, I am still impressed with the court's dedication to cost containment and desire to save taxpayer dollars, which has been demonstrated through the court's consolidation of payroll, financial, and HR services, as well as their efforts to use in-house staff to manage IT projects when possible. This does not go unnoticed by the subcommittee and is appreciated. Your mission is critical to the pillars of our nation and we thank you for your judicious and very effective use of the taxpayer dollars. The Supreme Court's fiscal year 2020 request includes funding for the Supreme Court justices, employees, as well as rent, travel, and other expenses. This represents a modest 3.5% increase over the fiscal year 2019 budget. I look forward to hearing from you on what we hope to accomplish in the fiscal year 2020 with this funding. Taking a step back, Congress provided an increase of $5.6 million for 34 new positions to address security needs. This was a critical request and I'm pleased that Congress was able to fund it. The safety of the justices as well as those who work and visit the Supreme Court should not be at risk. Let's continue to keep this dialogue on the ongoing security upgrades and additional resources needed to maintain a secure and welcoming Supreme Court environment open. I also want to briefly speak about an issue I care strongly about in providing the American people with more access to the Supreme Court. As Justice Brandeis famously wrote, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. That statement, while almost cliche now, is still rings true. Whether you're here in Washington or the comfort of your home, you can watch Congress and the executive branch 
and action on C-SPAN. That's an important part of making our nation's legislative and executive branch open and transparent to all people. But one government institution remains closed to the public eye, and that's the Supreme Court. These decisions on major cases from Brown versus Board of Education to Bush versus Gore have significantly shaped American society and changed history. Unfortunately, due to practices and policies, we have no video record of these historic decisions. In 2019, with so much new and innovative technology at our fingertips, it is time we should use every tool available to preserve America's judicial history. Beyond cameras in the court, most Americans have no idea how Supreme Court proceedings even work. I had the opportunity to be one of the few who got to sit in on the court proceedings when I attended oral arguments in the case concerning Chicago's handgun ban. This is an opportunity that should be available to all Americans. In the past, arguments on marriage equality have drawn substantive crowds causing people to line up in advance to order to gain access to the court. It's not unreasonable for the American people to have an opportunity to hear firsthand the arguments and opinions that will shape our society for years to come. The decision to release same-day audio from certain cases only highlights the fact that the Supreme Court has the technological capability to share audio of its proceedings with the American public. Lastly, as I said earlier, I think it's important for our two branches to keep an open dialogue and discuss issues when necessary, and not only once a year or so at a hearing such as this. So please know we are always happy to meet with you and discuss your concerns. So, Justices, we look forward to hearing from you about the resources that you need to carry out your constitutional responsibility and look forward to working with you in Congress. Before I turn to our witnesses for their statements, I would like to recognize <clears throat> the ranking member, Mr. Graves, for his opening remarks. Well, thank you, Chairman Quigley, and uh, welcome, Justice Alito and Kagan. It's good to have you with us today. Uh, an independent judiciary trusted to interpret the laws made by Congress and enforced by the executive branch is fundamental to fulfilling the Founding Fathers' vision for this country. Our system of checks and balances ensures a government for and by the people, and uh, we're, so, we're so thankful for your role in that. As a co-equal branch, it's valuable uh, for each of us to hear from, from you today. Uh, outside of the confirmation process, these hearings are one of the few instances that, that we get to uh, interact with our two branches of government and have the opportunity to uh, directly uh, ask questions and such. As we work together today to further examine the court's needs and operations, I wanna thank Chairman Quigley for assembling this, uh, this hearing today. Though the Supreme Court's budget request is not large at all in comparison to many of the other federal programs that this committee will hear from in the weeks ahead, I'm pleased that you're both here to testify. I also appreciate that the court has limited its request for additional resources. Uh, as the Republican leader of this subcommittee, I'm committed to looking at all our federal spending through a very fiscal, fiscally conservative and thoughtful lens. And with the federal debt uh, exceeding $22 trillion, it's especially important that we all work together to take steps to put our fiscal house back in order. And we're grateful for your, your effort in that as well. So keeping that in mind, we will certainly work to make sure that the court has the necessary resources to, to fulfill your constitutional uh, responsibilities. Justice Kennedy and Breyer appeared before this committee several times, and uh, we always appreciated their conversation, uh, their humor, their dialogue, and, uh, and certainly their guidance that they shared with us. And just the same, we look forward to your testimony today and uh, your insights of, of the operations of the court and grateful for your, your appearance before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. I would now like to recognize Ms. Granger, the ranking member of the full committee, for her testimony. I'd like to thank Mr. Quigley and Mr. Graves for holding this hearing for financial services today uh, on oversight of the highest court in the land, the U.S. Supreme Court. I'd like to add my welcome to our witnesses, Justice Alito and Justice Hagan. Uh, it's an honor to have both of you appear before us. The Supreme Court is vital to our system of government and ensuring the survival of our republic. This has been a particularly this has been particularly evident in recent years as the court has heard cases relating to religious liberty, health care, and the use of executive power. One of the responsibilities the Congress holds is the power of the purse, and that's why we're here today. I hope to learn more about the Supreme Court's operation and funding requirements for the fiscal year 2020. Uh, this is a rare, unique opportunity, as Mr. Graves said, and so we take it very seriously. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
I, I want to thank you, Ms. Granger. I would now like to recognize Justice Alito for his testimony. Supreme Court's budget request for fiscal year uh, 2020. Is the microphone on? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, as was mentioned, Justices Kennedy and Breyer appeared here many times in the past. This is uh, the first appearance for Justice Kagan and me. We are rookies, and I am sure when I get back to the court, I will hear immediately from either Justice, Ken Justice Kennedy or Justice Breyer, or perhaps both of them, that in all the times when they appeared here, they never broke any glass or spilled, <laughs> or spilled water. Um, but as, as I said, we are rookies, so uh, you have to indulge us a little bit. In any event, as in past years, our budget request consists of two parts. Uh, we will present the first part of the request today, this part addresses salaries and expenses of the court. The architect of the Capitol will submit a separate written statement on the second part of the request, which concerns the care of the building and the grounds. Before presenting our fiscal year 2020 request, we would like to express our appreciation for Congress's approval of our funding request for fiscal year 2019. We recognize that Congress and this subcommittee face a difficult task in allocating a limited amount of available money to fund a wide range of government activities. The judiciary's entire budget request is small compared to the overall federal budget, representing less than two-tenths of one percent of federal funding, and the Supreme Court's request, in turn, represents only about one percent of the judiciary's budget. But although our request is tiny in relation to the overall budget, we appreciate the value of every dollar of funding we receive. We are also grateful for the subcommittee's confidence in our ability to manage those funds efficiently. We remain fully committed to prudent fiscal practices. I should note that our fiscal year 2019 request following guidance from the Office of Management and Budget did not include funding for the cost of living adjustment for federal employees enacted in the most recent <coughs> appropriations legislation. That adjustment will likely cost the court an additional $1 million annually. To accommodate that increase, the court has reduced spending by revising existing contracts and cutting back on other discretionary spending. We hope that these cost-cutting me cost measures will allow us to forego requests for additional funding related to the cost of living adjustment. We do not have the capacity to reduce our mission or reduce our functions. We have no control, for example, over the number of petitions for review that are filed each year. Nevertheless, we continuously seek out ways to make our operations more efficient. We would also like to thank the members of the committee for providing the court with a substantial amount of additional funding last year. We are carefully and deliberately putting those funds to work, uh, and that was for security, additional security purposes. And we are carefully and deliberately putting those funds to work based on a top-to-bottom review of our current practices by highly regarded and experienced security experts. The money you have provided will be used efficiently to expand and improve our physical security and our cybersecurity. If we find that additional money is necessary to ensure the safety of the justices, court staff, and the many visitors received in our building every year, we will inform the subcommittee as soon as possible. I would be happy to refer the members of the committee and your staff following the hearing to appropriate court staff if there is a desire to discuss those security issues in greater detail. For fiscal year 2020, the court is requesting funding only to cover the continuation of existing activities. We are not requesting any new programmatic increases. The fiscal year 2020 request is $90 million consisting of $3 million in mandatory expenditures and $87 million in discretionary expenditures. The total request is $3 million higher than the amount provided in the last fiscal year. 
Half of this increase is due to an expected change in agency employer contributions to the Federal Employees Retirement System pursuant to guidance from the Office of Management and Budget. Most of the court's budget is devoted to personnel costs. Approximately 80% of the total request is for compensation and benefits of current employees. We have not requested a new non-security related position over the last 10 years. Instead, we have successfully utilized existing personnel to accommodate an increasing workload. For example, we recently implemented a new electronic case filing system using our existing budget. The system provides easy access to all of the court's case documents, including briefs, orders, and opinions without logging in or downloading additional software, and there is no charge associated with the use of this facility. It has been publicly accessible since 2017 through a link on the court's website. By building and maintaining this system in-house with existing staff, the court saved $2 million taxpayer dollars. In addition to accessing all case-related documents, the public may also use the website to access full transcripts of oral arguments on the same day they occur and audio of the arguments by the end of the week in which they take place. We have also recently revamped the court's website to make it more user-friendly and to highlight important information like the current term calendar and uh, uh, upcoming cases. As a result, virtually every aspect of the court's work is easily accessible to anyone with internet access. Last year, 19 million people visited the court's website, a 30% increase over the previous year. The Supreme Court building is also a popular attraction and forum for civics education here in Washington. The website's calendar lists the building's public hours and an online daily schedule of courtroom lectures in which our volunteer docents explain the history and the role of the court. Last year, 421,000 people visited the building and nearly one third of those visitors attended one of the free lectures or tours. Our 2020 request also includes $1.5 million of no year funding for regular upgrades to our IT systems, many of which have multi-year upgrade cycles. The court uh, reduced the request for this annual funding in fiscal year 2018 by $500,000, and the fiscal year 2020 request maintains that reduction. <clears throat> the annual savings are a direct result of the court's transition away from desktop computers to virtual workstations, which has reduced upgrade and maintenance costs. We will continue to monitor the no, uh, to monitor the no year fund balance to ensure it is adequate to meet our long term needs. When the public interacts with our judicial system, they see the substantial resources that Congress provides to the judiciary, whether it is courthouses, libraries, up to date information technology, or the thousands of staff who make the courts run smoothly and efficiently. The result is that these observers along with many others around the world, see a tangible, powerful example of a nation committed to the rule of law. On behalf of the Chief Justice and the other Associate Justices of the Court, we would like to extend our sincere thanks to the members of this subcommittee for your continued confidence and support. This uh, concludes our brief summary of our request, uh, and we would be pleased to respond to any budget-related questions that the members of the committee may have. Thank you, Justice Alito. We appreciate it. Um, you heard me mention in the opening the desire of many to uh, have video as well from the Supreme Court. Uh, in the past, we've had this debate, and I've, I've come to the conclusion, clearly it's, it's your decision. Um, and I believe in the independence and the autonomy of a separate branch. I just want you to know there are a lot of folks who, who can't, as you know, can't get into the Supreme Court to watch these arguments. In the case I mentioned and a few others, Brown versus Board of Education, there were historic, brilliant arguments made that only a, perhaps a few hundred people could watch in person. 
And I know that there are valid reasons why uh, behavior change, editing, and so forth. Um, we flub up a lot here, but we're on C-SPAN. And uh, so our mistakes are live. And while in a democracy, as Justice, as you know, the trains don't always run on time, we don't always look our best, and maybe it has a negative impact. The last time we had the discussion, it was the anniversary of the release of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The reason I bring that up is when that movie was released, it was screened before an audience which was largely U.S. Senate, and uh, uh, they didn't like it. <laughs> it didn't make us look good. The irony was it was also screened in Moscow and Berlin, and they made the decision not to show it in their countries because they thought it made us look too good. Uh, Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, I'd just like your thoughts on um, if there's an evolving sense within the court of whether or not to uh, expand to at least some limited video feeds of the arguments. The first thing I think I should say is that all of my colleagues and I share your interest in making our proceedings and everything that the court does as accessible to the public as we possibly can, consistent with the performance of our paramount function, which is to decide cases uh, in the best possible way. And I, I was thinking about this issue of access before coming over here. And what I'm going to say will date me, but uh, what occurred to me was how much more accessible the Supreme Court is now than it was when I started out as a lawyer. Uh, and even before that, when I was interested in the work of the Supreme Court when I was in college and, and even in high school, if someone back in those pre-internet days wanted to read a, an opinion that was issued by the court a few years ago, uh, it wouldn't be that easy to find a library with reports of the Supreme Court. Um, certainly the little municipal library where I grew up didn't have that. So you'd have to find a law library or a big library that had the US reports or one of the commercial services. And then if you wanted to take a copy home and read it and study it, you would have to, you might be able to make what we called in those days a Xerox copy uh, by feeding money into a machine. Now, every opinion that we issue is instantly available on our website. If you read an article in the paper about a decision that had just been handed down and you wanted to see exactly what the court said, that would be even more difficult. You would have to find a law library with a subscription service called US Law Week, and that was an expensive subscription service. And then you might get a little account of the argument if it was an important case. And you would be able within about a week to read the court's opinion. Now, if you wanted a transcript, uh, that would be extraordinarily difficult. You'd have to find a very good law library, and you wouldn't be able to get that for years. If you wanted to read the party's briefs, that would also be extremely difficult. Now, all of that is available free of charge to anybody who has access to the internet. Uh, we, we issue a transcript of all of our oral arguments on the day when the argument takes place. And today, it used to be a few years ago, uh, the, the person, the justice asking a question wasn't identified in the transcript. Now all the justices are identified, so you can see exactly what was said, every single word. And we release the audio of all of our arguments by the end of the week. But then we get to the issue uh, on which there's a lot of interest, and that is televising our arguments. And, and I recognize that most people think that our arguments should be televised. Most of the members of my family think that arguments should be televised. I used to think they should be televised. <laughs> when I was on the Third Circuit, we had the opportunity to vote on whether we wanted to allow our arguments to be televised, and I voted in favor of it. But when I got to the Supreme Court, I, I saw things differently, and it wasn't because I was indoctrinated or pressured by my colleagues, but I came to see, and I do believe that allowing the arguments to be televised would undermine their value to us as a step in the decision-making process. I, I think it, that lawyers would find it irresistible 
to try to put in a little soundbite in the hope of being that evening on CNN or Fox or MSNBC or one of the broadcast networks. And that would detract from the value of the, uh, of the arguments in the decision-making process. But I that recognize- That sort of thing never happens here. So. <laughs> You know, I recognize times change, and uh, I don't know what our successors years from now will think, or maybe even even next year. But uh, it has been a while since the members of the court collectively have discussed this issue, but it has been our consensus for a while that this would not be, although we want as much access as possible, we don't want access at the expense of damaging the decision-making process. Justice Kagan, your thoughts? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And if I could just thank all of you for the invitation to be here. We very much appreciate it, Justice Alito and I and the entire court. As to this question, I, I find it a very difficult question. And like Justice Alito, my views on this question have uh, somewhat evolved over time. And um, if, if you'll, if you'll uh, ag agree to let me get to the place where I tell you about the cons of cameras, I will start by telling you about the pros and very much sympathizing with some of the things that you said, Chairman Quigley, because um, I, I think more than just uh, transparency for transparency's sake, uh, the, uh, the good of having cameras would be that people would see an institution at work, which I think does its work pretty well. Um, uh, when I was Solicitor General, one of the jobs of Solicitor General in addition to arguing every month, is that you're always there when members of your office argue. And so um, the time I was Solicitor General, I probably sat as a spectator for about 75% of the Supreme Court's arguments. And, and I was constantly um, impressed by how the court went about its business, um, that uh, 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 it was thoughtful and it was probing and it was obvious that the justices really wanted to get things right. And uh, it's no small benefit if the American public were able to see that because uh, faith in institutions of governance is an incredibly important thing. And, and, uh, and for me, the greatest uh, positive of, of uh, having cameras would be that it would um, allow the public to see an institution working thoughtfully and deliberately and very much trying to get the right answers, all of us together. Um, but having said that, I will uh, wholeheartedly agree with Justice Alito that the most important thing is that the institution continue to function in that way, not that people see it. If, if the seeing it came at the expense of the way the institution functioned, that would be a very bad bargain. And uh, I do worry that uh, cameras might come at that expense. Um, uh, you know, there's that, um, I think it's a pr principle of physics, I think, uh, which is about how when you put the observer, uh, when the observer comes into, th the observed thing changes. And uh, you commented on Congress, and you know, if you all uh, were given truth serum, I think some of you might agree that hearings change when cameras are there. Now, I have to say, I think that they might change in the court in subtle ways. Uh, I don't think all that many people would grandstand. Uh, I hope that uh, my colleagues and I would not do that. But I think we would filter ourselves in ways that would be unfortunate. In other words, the first time you see something on the evening news, which taken out of context uh, suggests something that you never meant to suggest, um, uh, suggests that you have an opinion on some issue that you in fact don't have, but that you, you know, when I come into the courtroom, I play devil's advocate. I probe both sides hard, and uh, I, I, I challenge people in ways that might sound as though uh, I have views on things that I in fact do not, just because that's, uh, the best way of really understanding the pros and cons of, of, of a case. And I worry that that kind of questioning, which, which I think we all find uh, very conducive to good decision making, would, uh, would uh, you know, be damaged if, if, if there were cameras. So I, I, I think, as Justice Alito expressed, I think this is a hard issue. I think that there are things to be said on both sides of it, and I do want 
want to emphasize, as he emphasized, that we haven't spoken about this together as a conference um, since I've been at the court. Um, uh, but, um, but, but, but I think that there is real value to being deliberate and to being careful and to not doing things that we would later regret in terms of uh, how the institution operates. And I will say just one last point. In addition to all the things that Justice Alito said about the ways in which we are transparent, I think that the most crucial way that we are transparent is that all our decisions get made with reasons. In other words, you always know, or almost always, uh, when we make decisions, why we are making them and the views of, um, of the various justices of the court. That's the most important thing, far more important than the arguments, which in fact uh, play a very limited role in our decision-making process. Thank you so much. Joyce? Mr. Joyce needs to go to right. Mr. Joyce. your Republican leader in the Interior Committee here Sorry. momentarily. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank, you very, <clears throat> thank you very much for the, uh, taking, recognizing me out of turn. <clears throat> and when, when, we're, when I'm through asking my question and I get up and leave it, it's no disrespect to you, but Mr. Amade is sitting down there holding court for me before so I can get back to, the, to mine. Uh, as a former prosecutor and aging uh, trial warrior, this appearing before two ninths of the court is probably as good as it's ever going to get for me. But uh, I certainly appreciate, Justice Alito, what you were talking about, the transparency issue. And I appreciate what you've been doing as far as making the, the, the workings of the court available to them. But for those of us, uh, and the vast majority of us, who will never appear before the Supreme Court or down in the inferior courts, the appellate courts, the bankruptcy courts, the trial courts, as you know, we're on the PACER system and we have to pay money to get those things. Is, do you, uh, what impact do you think the Supreme Court's making this uh, uh, available for free has had on the tr uh, transparency of the court, if you will, and, and allowing people to have some input or uh, be able to see, without the use of cameras, be able to see in what you do? Well, I hope that the electronic filing and the other measures that have been taken in recent years will uh, increase understanding of the of the work of the court. Um, other than hearing our voices and uh, immediately or seeing our faces with our lips moving, the public can uh, see everything that goes on in, in the court, uh, from the filing of, of a petition for certiorari until we issue an opinion deciding a case. Uh, that's a, a tremendous development. And I think it's good that all of that is available to the public free of charge, uh, because we do want the public to understand what we do to the greatest extent possible. We also receive a, a great many visits during the course of a year from students, ranging from sometimes even elementary school students to, to groups of law students. Uh, and I, I think my, uh, my colleagues and I like the opportunity to speak to them and to explain to them what we do, because it is important in a democracy for the public to understand what all of the institutions do. Justice Kagan? Uh, I, I agree with everything uh, Justice Alito said on that. I mean, the electron electronic filing system that the court has put into place in the last um, year or two has, has made, I think, an enormous difference in, in uh, uh, for people who practice before the court, but also people who are just interested in the court. And um, uh, we were able to do it uh, with the appropriations that you gave us and, um, and a tremendous staff that put untold hours into that project. And um, so the justices are very appreciative of that. Well, I, for one, would disagree with the chairman in that I don't believe that uh, more visibility and cameras in the courtroom would be any good. I, I <clears throat> agree with your assessment just in my limited time here in the House. Uh, people are changed beings when they get in front of the camera and, and not all for the good. Uh, but I, I'm certainly interested in the transparency and the education of the public as to the collegiality of which the, the nine of you enjoy. And I think it, it gets ripped apart at times when people see five, four decisions. It's not an us against them game. It is the work and the hard work that you all put into it, asking those hard questions. In any way we can get the public to be able to visualize that without necessarily seeing it on camera. Uh, I'm all for, and I think the rest of this committee would be for, is helping you get that accomplished in not only in the Supreme Court, but in the lower courts as well. You know, you put your finger on something I think that uh, we find a little bit frustrating because um, we are a very collegial institution. We like each other quite a lot. 
And I think people think of the 5-4 decisions as you know, sort of the only thing we do. In <laughs> fact, Justice Alito and I agree with each other far more often than we disagree with each other. And um, uh, one of the things I think as we talk to groups, whether in law schools or elsewhere, I think all of us try to emphasize this, um, uh, the, the extent to which the court really functions as a unit. And, you know, of course there are going to be cases on which, in, in which um, are different views about how to do law, how to interpret the Constitution, uh, 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 put us in opposition to each other. But, um, uh, you know, 40, 50 percent of the time we're unanimous which is sort of an amazing thing given that we only take the hardest cases, cases on which there are splits in the courts below. Um, uh, another 30 or 35 percent of the time, we're split in all kinds of random and different ways. So, um, so I think it's one of the things that we would like to make clear to people is, is, uh, is, is, is how much of what we do does not follow this stereotype of, uh, of the uh, perpetually divided end of uh, court. <laughs> Would you care to respond? Well, I, yeah. I agree with what Justice Kagan said, and it is, it is an aspect of our work that is overlooked. That's understandably because it, the, the most controversial cases tend to be the ones where we're the most closely divided. And uh, we have developed a, a, a very open style of debating issues back and forth among the justices when there's a majority opinion and a dissent. We, we argue the issues uh, robustly, let me put it that way, and we don't, uh, increasingly we don't pull any punches. And I, it's, we don't take it personally. Uh, when one of my colleagues attacks my reasoning and says it doesn't make any sense, I don't take it personally. And I hope that the same is true when I uh, reciprocate, but I, I think sometimes people who read what we write may get the wrong impression that we are at each other's throats in a personal sense, and that, that is certainly not true. And this is not just something that we say for public consumption. This is the, this is the complete truth. Well, I, I yield back my time, but I'm all out, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here today. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our, our witnesses for appearing today, uh, Justice Alito, Justice Kagan. Uh, Justice Alito, as the, the lone Pennsylvanian here on this panel, uh, it's a pleasure to have a representative of the Third Circuit uh, here. Uh, it's hard for us to understand those Second Circuit accents, um, but it's <laughs> nice to have you here too, Justice Kagan. Uh, I know I speak for all of us uh, here on, on the Appropriations Committee and all of us in Congress when I say that we honor and fight for the independence of the judiciary. And as part and parcel of that, we fight for the security of the judiciary. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Between fiscal years 2018 and 2019, the Congress approved $5.6 million for security upgrades and modernization along with an additional 34 positions uh, for the Supreme Court. I'm pleased Congress was, was able to accommodate uh, the request and rest assured that we will continue to review and regard security requests coming from the Supreme Court with, as a top priority. First question is, does the fiscal 2020 Supreme Court budget properly cover your security needs? Are you getting what you want? We believe that it does, and, and we cannot uh, express strongly enough our appreciation for the support that the, that the committee has given us in the past. Uh, if it turns out that we have additional security needs, we will take the opportunity to, to let you know. But my understanding is that our security people and the outside experts they have consulted believe that we have the resources now that we need. And if you have a dissenting or a concurring opinion, just I'll let you, know. you let us know. Secondly, regarding the, uh, uh, the, 40, uh, the 34 new positions um, in, uh, involving the increase in security funds, are, uh, are you able to provide us a status update on those 34 new hires? Um, I think most of the positions have been filled. Am I correct? I'm sorry. Eight. All right. Eight have been hired as of last year. I'm, I stand corrected. 
About how long does We've it take? We've been taking um, this quite deliberately. The Chief Justice uh, uh, hired some security consultants, and those consultants have been talking to everybody in the building with a view on these questions, you know, to the police officers themselves, to the justices, about how exactly it is we should change some of the security practices that we follow, given that we will have greater resources. And um, uh, so we wanted to let that review process go forward before uh, 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 bef before hiring everybody. Okay. How long does it take to onboard one of these new hires, if you know? I, I don't know, personally. Uh, and, and this is not a pop quiz. You can Many get back to us. Many months I'm hearing from behind. This is our, I, I should have introduced some of the members of our staff who came here with us today, but this is our marshal, Pam Tolkien, who is in charge of the police force. And so she tells us that it takes many months, and that is certainly true. They, they go through standard federal law enforcement training before they begin. Well, uh, of course, one of the things driving my questions is this concern about the current political climate where we've seen uh, a rise in public criticism of, of not only the courts, but also specific judges. Um, and it's deeply disturbing to me and, and I think to all of us to see specific judges questioned not on intellectual grounds, but on personal grounds. Uh, most recently in the news, there was a, a photo posted online of uh, District Judge Amy Berman Jackson with a target placed on her likeness. Uh, these are deeply disturbing things to us um, and, of course, uh, she's not a, a Supreme Court justice, but here's the question. Do you believe Congress ought to consider increasing appropriations for the security needs of district and circuit court judges in the 2020 budget? Well, we are, are, are not, uh, I, I think, uh, fully cognizant of the, the security needs at this time of the, the lower courts. I believe when you receive testimony uh, regarding the overall federal judiciary budget, uh, th that would be uh, an opportunity for someone who is more knowledgeable to, to speak to that. But certainly, um, having been uh, a lower court judge, a court of appeals judge for 15 years, I'm very cognizant of the security needs of judges at those levels. In some respects, there, the security threats to them are more serious than they are to us because district judges, trial judges at all levels uh, have much greater contact with members of the public and are often involved in cases where emotions run very high. And so there, the, many of the instances of unfortunate attacks on judges have been on, on trial level judges. I thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Granger. Thank you. Uh, each year between 6,000 and 8,000 cases are filed with the Supreme Court. And the court usually hears arguments for, we have numbers of 70 to 90 cases. So uh, Justice Alito, I'd ask you, uh, can you tell us how those court, how the court decides which cases to hear? Yes, we have two main criteria. And we select our cases based on the application of those criteria. The first and the most important is, is there a disagreement about a significant legal issue among the lower courts? Uh, this can be a conflict in the decisions of the federal courts of appeals or conflicts involving state supreme courts. What the Constitution means and what the statutes enacted by Congress mean should be the same everywhere in the country. The, the law should not mean one thing in one state or one judicial circuit and something else in another circuit. So that's the main thing that we look for. But we will also take cases that involve what we regard as an important issue of law that should be decided without any further delay, without waiting to see whether there will be a disagreement among the lower court, among the lower courts. And the, the best example of that is a situation in which uh, a statute enacted by Congress is held to be unconstitutional. We will almost always review that, even uh, if there is no conflict in the decisions of the lower courts. Now, there are some other cases that are also very important and we will take without 
uh, without a conflict. But those are the two main things that we look for. Thank you. Uh, Justice Kagan, are, are, would you say that there are additional worthy cases you think should be reviewed? You know, I, I think um, all or most of us think that we probably could handle a, f a few more cases than we currently do. And in the abstract, I think we would say, well, instead of that 70 cases, why not handle 90? Uh, but then it turns out that uh, even though we, we, we all think that, we don't find 90 cases to take using the criteria that Justice Alito uh, laid out. That using those criteria, that's about what we've been coming up with year by year. It used to be that it was much more. Uh, you know, I, I clerked on the court about 30 years ago, and at that time the court was handling 140 cases per year, which was too many. They, uh, I don't think anybody would want to go back to that. But, uh, but there's been a lot of ink spilled about why it is that the court's docket has declined. I don't think it's because the court uh, has wanted to be at, at, at 70. I, I think, as I said in the abstract, I think we all would like to have some more. Um, but when we apply those criteria, which are the criteria, I, th I think there's a, a, a very wide acceptance on the court that, that, is, that those are the criteria that we should be using. And when we apply those criteria, we've you know, ended up certainly since, since I've gotten to the court, which is almost 10 years ago now, um, with about that many cases. Thank you. That's the only question. I have just one statement. Going back to the discussion about your security, you know, you're, you're very important to us, to the nation, the Supreme Court. And so if there is a need for additional security dollars, I'm sure that this subcommittee would be uh, uh, very much in favor of it. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much. And let me welcome uh, to our distinguished uh, justices. Uh, let me ask two questions. I'll, I'll, I'll ask them both, and perhaps I can expedite time. Uh, the first has to do with uh, law clerk diversity. Uh, a fairly recent National Law Journal study examining uh, Supreme Court clerks from 05 to 7, 2017 found that the composition of the Supreme Court clerks does not even remotely reflect the makeup of our country. 85% uh, of clerks during this period were white, 9% were Asian, 4.1% were black, and 1.8% were Latino. Uh, clerking on the Supreme Court allows uh, these attorneys to participate in deliberations that directly influence the interpretation of our nation's laws. And these decisions impact hundreds of millions of people uh, in the country and sometimes across the world. And these clerks are often on a fast track to judgeships, uh, positions in academia, high-profile attorney positions in and outside of government. Are you concerned about the potential impacts that can result from a court that does not reflect the populace that it serves? And what, if anything, is the court doing to address that issue? Uh, my second question has to do with the tax on the court. Uh, last November, uh, Chief Justice Roberts stated that after a number of attacks on the judiciary by President Trump, quote, we do not have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges. We have what is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. That independent judiciary is something we should all be thankful for. Uh, do you believe that recent verbal attacks on the judiciary undermine the ability to interpret the Constitution and laws of the United States? Uh, do you believe that the recent attacks um, undermine the stature, the reputation, and the respect for the court, uh, and the strength and the foundations, therefore, of our democratic system. Um, uh, Congressman Bishop, I'll take your first question. Uh, uh, th this is an issue that I believe we take very seriously. Uh, each of us hires individually, so there is uh, an extent to which we can't um, uh, talk for any of uh, of, of our colleagues, um, but I think that the court as a whole uh, uh, it, it certainly uh, pays attention to this issue and cares about it. There are, um, uh, you know, many different kinds of, of diversity, um, and, and before I get to the one that I think you're most 
uh, concerned about as I am. I, I will just say that uh, we should keep all of them in mind, um, not just sort of racial, ethnic, and gender diversity, but there is uh, there are uh, criticisms of the court with respect to its geographic diversity, with respect to its uh, school diversity. When I when I wander around and go to law schools, I hear more questions about uh, the number of clerks that come from just a few schools than I do almost anything else. All of these are very important. With respect to um, uh, race and gender, I think we are doing better. Uh, I know this. I, I referred before to the fact that I was a clerk on the court a few decades ago. And uh, the, the, uh, if you want pathetic numbers, those were some pathetic numbers. Um, and the numbers are much higher now. I think uh, for, for, for women now, this is our first year where we have uh, a majority of clerks are women. Um, and, uh, and we are doing better on the front of racial diversity as well. But uh, that's not to say that there isn't a, a great deal more to do. And um, as with uh, most of these issues, sort of the higher you go, on a, uh, these, are, these are, are real pipeline issues. And the higher you go, the stronger and firmer and more inclusive the pipeline has to be. And uh, this, is, this is something that I know I thought about a lot when I was a law school dean, and in part what, what, what um, uh, are to make the, the, the court and its clerks more diverse, you need very diverse um, law schools. You need uh, 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 judges and law firms um, because we take our clerks, certainly they have to come from uh, other uh, appellate judges, sometimes district judges, more and more they come from law firms so that the more inclusive and diverse those institutions are, uh, the better that pipeline will serve us. And uh, over time, I'm uh, confident that that pipeline will become uh, more inclusive, more diverse, but, uh, but, but that means that we all have to be working at it, uh, every single one of us, in the law firms, uh, other, law, uh, other judges, in the law schools, and us. And maybe, you know, the most important thing is, is for uh, us to use whatever bully pulpit we have to make clear that this is an important issue, that diversity in the legal profession is a matter of, uh, of real uh, significance, that uh, the legal profession is made stronger uh, by how diverse and inclusive it is. Uh, no profession fares well if you don't take advantage of the talents and the perspectives and the experiences uh, of, uh, of all kinds of different people. And uh, for us to, to use this kind of setting and other sorts of setting to say exactly that and to say that this is an issue of deep concern. Mr. Chairman, I think my time has expired uh, unless the chair would uh, uh, give you me know, some You know, and I probably, time. you're correct, and it probably is, uh, I was. Is that because I filibustered? Is that the <laughs> idea? <laughs> well done. You, you've learned how these cameras work here. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Justice, if you could answer Mr. Bishop's uh, question in, in a succinct manner, I, I would appreciate that. Which we, As opposed I to your pretty colleague. <laughs> uh, I apologize. I don't mean it that way. Uh, I, I know everybody <laughs> wants to get a, a, a series in, and I, I should have mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, certainly. Uh, well, I won't, add, I won't add much to what Justice Kagan said about the first question about law school, uh, law clerk diversity. There is the, the funnel issue. All of our law clerks, because they serve with us for only a year and they have to hit the ground running, I will get to the, uh, the second question in one second, uh, come from a court of appeals clerkship at one point. They need that for the training. Uh, on the second issue, it's very important, and I, I do not want to talk about any particular incident, but uh, in general terms, um, I will say this. I think it is extremely important for all of the members for, of all three branches of our government to be um, accurate and respectful when we are talking about members of the other branches. We all have important work to do. Uh, we all do our best. Uh, we all make mistakes. Uh, there are, are constitutional procedures for correcting uh, the mistakes that are made by lower court, their lower court judges. But I think we all have to be, uh, have to be careful, uh, consistent with uh, sort of the American way of, of robust public debate to be respectful and accurate in what we say. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Graves. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I, I know you are keenly aware of all the things that we're working on every day. I'm sure you, you, you watch and monitor, uh, and, and I say that jokingly. But there is one thing today that maybe you could comment on. There, you know, We've been debating yesterday and today on uh, a bill that uh, rewrites the election laws uh, here in our country, and many would suggest it's unconstitutional. And in some ways, the bill itself uh, admits that in its own criticism of Supreme Court decisions in the past justifying law changes today. Um, not asking you to comment on the bill itself, that's just more editorial, but there is one provision that has a de direct impact on the courts, and I wanted to get your opinion on it. Um, it was sort of added at the last minute in the Rules Committee without any kind of committee hearing, uh, but it requires that the uh, Judicial Conference's Code of Conduct apply to the Supreme Court justices. And uh, I'm not sure why that was added, but is there something we should be concerned about in the Supreme Court? Is there a Code of Conduct issue? Well, I will, would require I will try this to be. I will try to be succinct. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I. Sp I know I speak for all of my colleagues in saying that we take our ethical responsibilities very seriously. We uh, are committed to behaving in an ethical manner and in a way that it appears to the public is is fully ethical. We uh, follow the code of conduct that applies to the lower courts. Uh, but we don't regard ourselves as being legally bound by it. And the reason for that is, uh, can be found in the structure of Article Three of the Constitution, which says that the judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may create. Now, I was a judge on one of those inferior courts using the 18th century terminology for 15 years. They are not inferior in the sense of being uh, uh, less talented or less deserving of respect, but they are subordinate. And we th uh, I think uh, that it is inconsistent with the constitutional structure for lower court judges to be reviewing the, uh, reviewing uh, uh, things done by Supreme Court justices for, for uh, compliance with, with ethical rules. So that is the that, that is the concern about being formally bound by those ethics, those ethics rules. And our situation is not exactly the same as that of the, of the lower court judges. Our, so no, our working no, life is a little different. No known misconduct issues. I mean, there's only nine of you, and it's explicit. It's not about uh, uh, clerks or staff or anything else. It is only justices. Well, I'll just I, I'm just curious why uh, somebody would add this at the what, last minute. What That's Justice all. Alito said uh, in, 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 in his first remarks, which is, we take our ethical obligations extremely seriously, and um, we we do follow the code. The code does not itself answer all questions. Where we have uh, questions about the code and how it applies, um, uh, typically we we have a, a very strong legal office that is well-equipped to deal with issues like this. We consult with them. Uh, maybe we'll consult with uh, uh, our colleagues or some of them, uh, the Chief Justice in particular. Um, but uh, all of us take our responsibilities in this area extremely seriously. And um, uh, I, I, I agree with Justice Alito about the, the, the sort of constitutional difference between the Supreme Court and, and the um, circuit and district courts. But, um, but in one thing, we are definitely not different, which is uh, that uh, we, we follow those guidelines to the very, very, very best of our ability. Thank you. And I never questioned that at all. Um, apparently, though, somebody in the majority party does, and, uh, and I don't know why. But thank you for, for answering that. Um, quick question on cybersecurity. Big, big concern this committee has addressed a lot with a lot of the other agencies. Um, clearly, the Supreme Court has a lot of very important information that it must protect uh, from cyber attacks. Is there anything you could speak to on that? Just to give us a little bit of um, reassurance or, uh, you know, some of your, the plan or proposal that you have in place. I, I am very far from being a cyber, a cyber expert. Maybe my colleague is, mm -hmm. uh, she's younger and maybe she's uh, uh, more knowledgeable than I am. I, we, have, we have a very good IT staff, and uh, they assure us that we are, we are well protected, and uh, I, I, I trust that that, is, that that is true, but it is certainly, it is certainly a problem. Uh, we don't want uh, individuals to hack into our system. You most likely have many cybersecurity experts on staff, I, I, would, 
I would suppose, right? Yeah. We do in, have, in your we do have people on staff who, who work on this, and when they tell us the number of attempts that are made uh, on a regular basis, it's kind of uh, it's startling. Alarming. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Torres. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, for um, holding this hearing, and thank you so much to our justices for being here. Uh, indeed, I, I agree with my colleagues that today is a special day when uh, two branches of government can come together um, to talk about the issues that are you know, pending and important to both of us. Um, we want to make sure that you have the resources that you need uh, to carry out your constitutional duties uh, and apply the law fairly. You know, justice, right? Mm, liberty and justice for all. As we discuss salaries and expenses for the Supreme Court, um, in, we have entered a new era where women are taking their place in the House of Congress, in the Senate, as clerks, and as you yourself have um, stated, um, that you have a large number of women now that you have hired on. Um, it is important to me um, as a female member of Congress to be able to answer that question that was asked earlier. How do we know without an inspector general, um, how do we know um, how many cases of misconduct actually exist? And I'm not uh, probing as to relating to justices, but as a whole, we all have peers, right? Um, how do we know? Well, the Chief Justice and the Judicial Conference have, have taken this issue very seriously in the last couple of years, and uh, a working group was formed to examine the practices of the entire federal judiciary, and the working group delivered its report with some very substantive recommendations, and it is my understanding that those are being implemented. I, I am not aware of particular of, of problems on the Supreme Court itself, but I certainly can assure you that all of the justices are aware of this potential problem, and if uh, it were to come to our attention that there were any problems along these lines regarding re involving anybody who works across, uh, uh, across in the Supreme Court building, uh, we would not sit back. We would take action that's appropriate. Congress has taken has taken you know this issue very serious um, as of lately um, because we have had some issues and um, Congress has an ethics uh, committee that is made up of members of Congress. So while I understand that Chief uh, Justice Roberts and Justice Breyer have <clears throat> argued in the past that there are two reasons um, why. There is no process, public process that exists. Um, they argue that essentially a code of conduct is impossible to enforce on justices as there aren't judges that we could bring to the Supreme Court to replace justices. Um, that's what I, I'm bringing up the issue of, um, as with Congress, where we have our own you know, ethics uh, group that puts that is a check and balance on members. Um, secondly, it was argued that the code of conduct created by the Judicial Conference with Chief Justice Roberts um, presides over it on, is only an instrument of the lower courts. And I find these arguments um, unconvincing. Um, I think, you know, there 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 are messages that we send. Uh, to our employees when we don't uh, put forward transparent policies on how we are going to um, protect um, victims and how we are going to deal with uh, whistleblowers and protect whistleblowers. Um, I hope that at some point, uh, without disclosing specific information, that we could have um, a conversation around this issue because it is an important issue, not only to our nation, but to the world. Women all over the world are finding their voice and it cannot stop at the Supreme Court. Well, I do believe that with respect to a code of judicial conduct, just, Justice Alito has suggested some of the reasons 
why we have reservations about following the same code that applies to uh, lower court judges. But, uh, but for that reason, the Chief Justice is, um, is, is studying the question of whether to have a code of judicial conduct that's applicable only to the United States Supreme Court. So that's something that we have not discussed as a conference yet and that um, has pros and cons, I'm sure. But, uh, but it's something that's, um, that's being thought very seriously about. And then with respect to the sexual assault issue in particular, as it relates to the entire judicial branch, this is something which I think that the Chief Justice has been um, uh, 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 you know, really proactive in getting a, a, a wonderful committee together of judges and circuit executives, court executives. And um, uh, the final recommendations, I believe, are going to be uh, voted on this spring, that the circuit conference is going to vote on a set of recommendations, which do many of the things that you said, not just make clear what conduct is forbidden, but also protect against retaliation and make the processes for reporting uh, very streamlined or much more streamlined than they've been. And of particular concern in the judicial branch, I think that there's been an, an, uh, some uh, reservations about you, you take um, uh, people take seriously the, the, uh, the sort of confidentiality of a chambers, but making it quite clear that that confidentiality gives way um, uh, when people are reporting sexual misconduct, and and so taking taking that off the table with respect to these kinds of allegations. Thank you very much. I'm very interested in this subject. So if there's anything that I can do to help move forward. Yeah, please let our office know, and I yell back. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Thank you, Chairman. Justices, what an honor it is to have you here. Um, I think it's been a helpful conversation. It's far less contentious than many of them, and we're grateful for the uh, calm demeanor that you bring to us. Uh, if you allow me, you can me... start fighting if you want. <laughs> It'll come. Uh, if you allow me, two very quick personal observations, then a question. I'm not an attorney. Um, I actually was going to go to law school and very late decided to go in the military, but I come from a family of attorneys. One of my brothers is a district court judge, and three of my sons are attorneys. One of them actually, Justice Kagan, is at Harvard and going to law school there. I'm very proud of him. Uh, I wondered sometimes why they chose that career path, but I am, I, I say, proud of, of where they are. And, and the second thing is, uh, I want to go back to our conversation regarding televised remarks, and I want you to know that I agree with your reservations about that. And I'm someone who understands that the cameras and the openness is a very important part of Congress. That's work that we do. Mr. Quigley and I both sit on the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, most of our work is done in a, in a basement without cameras and without people there that are, uh, that are observing. And I think we would both tell you that you do have a different experience when cameras are there. And it's a, especially if it's an emotional topic, which, by the way, you all deal with all the time. Uh, some of them are a little less so, but many of them are the most contentious issues facing our society right now. And I can imagine that that would maybe change your process. Now, if you could, I'm going to ask a question, and I don't know if you're going to bear with me and feel comfortable asking or answering it, but I'm going to I'm going to try. And it kind of builds on what Chairwoman Granger said when she was indicating, you know, six to eight thousand cases before you, of which you select a very small number, seventy or eighty or ninety. And it seems like my concern would compel that to change and maybe force you to do more. But it, my concern is far broader than that. And it's this thing that we've seen in recent, recent past, the last half a generation maybe, of nationwide injunctions that are imposed by a single district court judge at various locations around our, around our nation. They bar the federal government from enforcing law or policy far more reaching than, I, than their own district. And as I said, in by definition, it, it extends to everywhere in the United States. And as I was thinking about this and, and doing a little reading on it, I mean, it, 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 you all know this. I didn't, but it, uh, the first time it happened was in 1963, 200 years to get to where we had this kind of precedent. But in the last year alone, we've had 22 of these. And it seems to be an explosive uh, trajectory for our federal courts to impose these these nationwide injunctions. And I suppose that compels you to look at many more cases because those have to be examined. Could you share your thoughts on that? It, it concerns me. Does it concern you? Does this concern the court? 
Uh, is this a good thing for our country, and is there a way to correct it? I, I appreciate your remarks, and this is a, an important issue. Uh, some of my colleagues, I believe, have written on it a little bit in recent years. It's an issue that is being discussed increasingly in scholarship, and it is an issue that may come before the court in uh, the near future. So I don't think I can say more about that uh, and certainly can't suggest how I think we should decide the issue and wouldn't be in a position to be able to say that until the issue came before us and, and the issue was briefed. We have had uh, an increase during the last year or so in cases in which we have been asked to stay injunctions that have been issued by the district courts. Uh, and we have received applications from the Solicitor General in a number of cases to grant certiorari before judgment, uh, which would allow us to take a case directly from a district court bypassing the Court of Appeals. That's a procedure that's always been available, but it's always been recognized as one to be used quite, to be used, uh, uh, quite sparingly. Um, I, I think I don't think I can go further on that issue. Justice Kagan, do you want to share any any thoughts? Uh, not really. I understand, and I, 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 of course, not being completely oblivious, I ex anticipated that you know you would be very cautious in how, and how you responded. Can I ask for one clarification, and just for my own knowledge, when we do have these nationwide injunctions, does that compel you to examine all of those cases, or or not in every case? Uh, they, they are typically made in connection with uh, a petition for a writ of certiorari, which is a matter of court discretion. So uh, we don't have to grant certiorari in any, in any case, and uh, it, therefore the, the application is also discretionary. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you, Ms. Kirkpatrick. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, both my husband and I are attorneys, and so is our oldest son. So we not only read your opinions, we debate them at the dinner table. Uh, and so I appreciate your thoughtful deliberation. You do take the hardest cases and your excellence uh, in legal writing. Uh, we, we as a family very much appreciate that. And of course, being from Arizona, uh, we're very fond of former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Alito. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to hear from you today as her successor, not replacement. You can't replace exactly. Sandra Day O'Connor, but uh, thank you again both for being here. Uh, my question involves um, financial disclosure. Supreme Court justices, like all federal judges, file an annual financial disclosure, disclosure report each May. But unlike members of Congress, these reports are not posted online. Would you support a change in policy to online disclosures? As a practical matter, they are available online almost as soon as they are released to the public. Uh, there are private groups that request all of the financial disclosure forms of the justices as soon as that is possible, and as soon as they obtain them, they put them online. So as a practical matter, they are already available online, and anybody can see any of our financial disclosure forms. Uh, we, we, we follow the, the procedure that's set out in, this, in the Ethics in Government Act and in the implementing regulations of the Judicial Conference on, on this matter. And uh, we have not gone further, but that is certainly something that we could consider if there is a real issue, because the, they are they are documents that are available to the supposed to be available to the public. And you were talking about the transparency of your website and the things that you uh, post there, and that was what sort of prompted my yes. question there. Um, uh, Justice Kagan, anything different? No, uh, I think that is my view too. Okay. Again, along the lines of financial disclosure, currently the Supreme Court justices are not bound by the Stock Act, which requires members of Congress to post 
securities transactions within 45 days. Do you see any reason that federal judges, including the justices, should not be included in such a measure? Um, you know, I, I've, I've not looked into that piece of legislation, um, so I don't know uh, what's, what's in it. Um, uh, but it would certainly be something that, you know, uh, maybe we would take a look at it as to whether there were some kinds of transactions that some of us might be participating in that in, in, in other branches of government are being reported and in ours not. I, I, just, I just don't know that to be the case, but certainly we'll take it back with us. Thank you. Thank you. All in the interest of more transparency. You know, when we are prohibited by statute from participating in any case in which we have a financial interest. So if we own stock in a, in a company that is a party or related to a party, a subsidiary or a parent, uh, then we are prohibited from participating in that case. And all of that is disclosed in our financial disclosure uh, form. Thank you again. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it's wonderful to have both of you here today. Thank you for your presence. Um, I was curious, um, it's been four years, I believe, since um, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court has been before this committee. Do you think it would be advantageous to have this opportunity on a more regular basis, or do you think this is sufficient? Well, we were talking uh, before the hearing began with the chairman, and he was suggesting that he would not uh, think that this is an every year kind of thing, but an every few year kind of thing. I hope I hope I'm not misrepresenting you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, you, but uh, you know we are at your disposal. So I think it's a kind of I agree with the chairman. It's a uh, you might not get uh, it might not be different enough. Year by year by year might be sort of repetitive, right. but uh, but uh, if you want us if you want us to come back in a few years' time, we would be glad to do so. Thank you. Um, and then my only other question: I was just kind of curious. I noticed that there's discussion of the 2020 Supreme Court salaries and expenses budget totals 90.4 million dollars, um, and that 87.7 uh, is for discretionary expenses. Can you elaborate on what those might be? I'm well, just those, not aware. Yeah, that's all. those are uh, the, the mandatory expenses are the salaries uh, of the justices that cannot be decreased pursuant to the Constitution. That's why they're called mandatory. It's somewhat misleading terminology, but the discretionary expenditures are everything else, and the vast bulk of that uh, uh, consists of the salaries and benefits for our staff. Uh, so the amounts that they are entitled to in accordance with their, their, their pay grade. Is there any per diem or travel uh, expense allocation? I, I, there is, uh, not for us. Uh, there are for, most of the members of our staff don't do a lot of traveling. Our police officers do, and uh, yes, I sir. assume that there is a per diem for them. Probably when you would travel, they would need to be with you, I assume. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'll just ask the, the ranking member if there's any member on his side who has a second round of questions. Um, and I'd ask my members as well if someone has a second round. All right. Yeah, there is one thought. There was some curiosity on how the shutdown impacted the court. Uh, you seem to be up and running. It was some ability to move forward? Did that impact you in any way? Well, fortunately, it, it did not. Uh, we operated, my understanding is that we operated during the shutdown using the same pool of funds as the rest of the judiciary. And those are funds that are derived from the filing fees that parties uh, are required to pay in civil cases. So we are permitted to use those for uh, for yeah. operating expenses in an emergency such as that. Unfortunately, there was enough money for no. us to keep operating during the shutdown. Very good. Justices, do either of you have anything else you'd like to add? Thank you very much for having us. We thank you so much. Uh, the ranking member and myself and all members here, thank you very much for your service and your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
This was the first appearance of Justice Alito and Justice Kagan before the committee, and 